The following program is presented by the Metropolitan Library Service Agency. Hello, welcome to All About Kids, a program focusing on the interests of children and young people and some of the issues affecting them. Today we'll be talking about the role of storytelling in preserving and maintaining Jewish culture and heritage. Storyteller and puppeteer Marilyn Price from Illinois will be discussing this with Rabbi Joseph Edelheit from Temple Israel in Minneapolis. During the program, both of our guests will share a couple of their favorite stories. Rabbi Edelheit, Marilyn Price, we're delighted to have you here today and you have some of your very interesting looking friends and we'll be talking about them later in the program, but let's start out by talking a little bit about what sounds like rather a not only unique and innovative but revolutionary program <laughs> that the two of you are participating in. Marilyn, you're from Illinois and you are here working with some of the uh, members of the Jewish community in the mm -hmm. metropolitan area. Yes, I'm from Evanston. Uh, I work, well, I've worked with Joseph before on this project, and he, having just come here, uh, invited me to come and try it here. It's a community-wide sing-along. We are hoping to have it, and will have it, on April 11th of 1993. It's a Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, which is a fabulous musicale, but this is a participatory one where the audience gets script and sings along with the musical directors. Um, are these professional people in your yes. audience? Are they just no, children, no, no. families? Anybody and everybody. Yeah. It's, we, we did it in Chicago. It was a major success, lots of fun. But what's different about this one is we are drawing the entire community, the entire Jewish community, and open, of course, to everybody, to come and participate from, I've talked to the Jewish community in Duluth, down to Rochester, St. Paul, Minneapolis, um, Hopkins, and whoever else will answer their phone and listen to hmm. me. And we will meet at a central place, and they, the musicians will be scripted and rehearsed, but the audience gets a book with the words in it. And then I'm going to add some of my friends. Uh, I have a, created a Joseph puppet, a life-size puppet, who will participate in the show as well, which will encourage little people as well as the older ones. The little people sort of were left out last time. And, we and you'll be doing more than one performance? You'll be Probably this year we're going to do one. Uh, we're doing this to continue the upgrading of how important we think Jewish camping is. In particular, Ellen Sang Ruby Union Institute, as well as Camp Tico and Camp Herzl and the, the various camping opportunities in the Minnesota area, uh, with which I'm not as aware as I am with Ellen Sang Ruby Union Institute, having just come here to Minneapolis. And we're doing that to make sure that people understand uh, and use this vehicle that informal Jewish education, the ability to tell a wonderful story as this does, a biblical story in music and contemporary music, and that is transferable to what happens in Jewish camps. So uh, Marilyn came up at our invitation and is working with people to coordinate it, and we're very excited about what it's going to be like. Well, there's something very exciting about everyone working together on a production oh. of mm -hmm. any sort and the idea of getting people involved who may never have been in any kind of a dramatic it, production. And it's then. a good vehicle not only to teach the story, because you learn always better by story, which would interesting segue for us, um, but everyone likes to sing, and even if you don't know the words, this is such an easy piece, you can la la all the way through and nod wisely. They well, even let tone deaf rabbis sing. Uh, yeah, we did. It was uh, under debate for a long <laughs> time. We voted and said, okay, you have I to sing. I think I've seen things like uh -huh. that happen in other congregations, too. It gives everybody a chance to be a star. Well, and it's a, a production that people know. It's been mm -hmm. on Broadway. Mm -hmm. It's it's appeared in as a traveling road show in right. in this area before too. You talked before we get back to storytelling. I'm interested. You talked about Jewish camping, and that's something mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with. Mm -hmm. Well, there are wonderful, wonderful summer camp opportunities in which not only are all of the summer camp activities of boating and swimming and all of the kind of sports things that go on, but Jewish study, Hebrew learning. Uh, creating communities 
and Olin Sang Ruby Union Institute, which is the Reform Jewish camp uh, for the whole Midwestern area, is a camp with which I've been affiliated for 19 years. And it's really an extraordinary place. Camp Tiko, which is a Jewish camp affiliated with Temple Israel here in Minneapolis, another extraordinary place where people learn in an informal setting the values and, and some of the language and skills that we can try and provide in the supplemental religious schools. But I've often said if I could get everybody, all the youth, to go four summer sessions to a great Jewish camp, I'd cancel religious school. I don't have a, a lot of hope of that ever happening, <laughs> but uh, it's the kind of statement and I can And he's have. not alone in that. A lot of people believe that too. And this camp, all, all of the camps so far that I know of, the Jewish camps that Joseph spoke of, I have adult programming as well. Right. My job is as arts program coordinator is to do things like this Joseph project, the, jo the sing-along project, and to do, I do a woman's retreat on Judaism and the arts and women, and a teen retreat. It's a family camp. It's a, a great place to live and learn whatever you do. And we usually focus around telling, and then we bring in experts in Judaica, like Rabbi Edelheit and others, uh, and they teach to all levels. They teach each other. There's rabbinic seminars there as well. It's a great place. Do you see this as a, a resur resurgence of people's interest in their heritage, in their culture, in their religion, and a way of making it very alive rather than going once a week to synagogue? And, Institutional and, and religion has a very key role in serving people, especially during life cycle moments and in maintaining the publicness of religion. If you are able to take people outside the grand institution and put them in an informal community building place, you're able to do different kind of learning. So I don't know that camping is necessarily a resurgent element. We've had Jewish, especially reformed Jewish camping, uh, although the conservative movement certainly has wonderful camps as well, for better than 35 years. Um, I'm very impressed with what I see, Camp Tico, and there's a Camp Herzl in the area, what Jewish camping has done mm -hmm. to add to the quality of the Jewish community in the Twin Cities. Having only really been here three weeks, it's a little difficult for me to wax eloquent about that. So, As a, a leader in your community, do you yourself use storytelling with yes. your congregation? Mm -hmm. He does. I've heard him. Uh, there's a story I will tell, and then the, the storyteller really needs to have much more of the focus, and it's a famous story told about uh, the Baal Shem Tov, the master of the good name, who was the founder of the Hasidic movement in the 18th century, uh, that he needed to perform some great miracle because a terrible disaster was going to befall the people. And so, as the story goes, he went to a specific place in the forest, and lit a fire in a particular way and said a particular prayer. And the miracle happened, and the disaster did not befall the community. In the next generation, it fell to one of his disciples, the Magid of Mizrach, to again save the people. And as the story goes, he went back to that particular place in the forest and lit the fire in a particular way, but he no longer knew the prayer but it was enough. And in the next generation, it fell to Rabbi Israel of Rizhin to again save the community from a terrible disaster. And so he went back to that particular place in the forest, but he no longer knew how to light the fire nor say the prayer, and it was enough. Finally, it fell to Rabbi Moshe Lieb of Sassoff, who, wanting to spare his community from a terrible disaster, no longer knew where to go in the forest and could no longer light the fire nor say the prayer. All he could do was tell the story, and that was enough. And from that, they teach us God created human beings to tell stories. And to listen. Mm -hmm. That is fascinating. You could have been a children's library. <laughs> That's all. There's still time, wonderful. don't you think? I <laughs> think so. And that segues, as you <laughs> said earlier, right into um, one of the wonderful new books that we have in the library is The Diamond Tree, which is a compilation of Jewish folk tales from around the world. And the, the compiler, Howard Schwartz, 
wanted to bring tales mm -hmm. that conveyed how values, not just Jewish values, these are values, mm -hmm. these are human values, and and qualities of, of human beings come through. And it, it's a wonderful way, I think, for children and adults from all religions, all cultures, cultures to learn about each other, to hear those kinds of stories and to stop and think. And it's that's amazing. And is that why you're a storyteller, Marilyn? One of the reasons? That and uh, children of my own. And that I grew up telling stories with my brother who, because this was pre predated television. We shared a room together and he would tell me a story to go to bed and I would tell him one. We each went our separate ways. He became a rabbi and I became a storyteller and we both do the same job. I except that I also work in the secular community a great deal. But I often tell Jewish stories because the message of all my stories, I don't tell a story unless it has a great message. Not a strong beating them over the head message, but a nice quiet message. And I've used stories in all sorts of mediums. Uh, Joseph and I have done AIDS awareness programs together. We, I call it um, Good Cop, Bad Cop. I tell them a story using, I mean, I've used a variety of mediums. My puppets are a variety of mediums. Uh, I'm a puppeteer. So this is a puppet. This is the good guy. Yeah, this is the good guy too. Uh, and this is the bad guy. And that oh, particular, I have to hold him. And this is a story really about self-esteem which has a lot to do with how kids respond to other situations. So I would do an, an opening like that. And then Joseph talked about AIDS and its particular implications to them. We did this to I don't know, somewhere like 400 seventh, seventh graders. graders, a mind-boggling. Right. One of the hardest audiences. Well, in well, which my son sat in the... In the very first row. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't have had a better group of critics. But softening the blow, so to speak, with a story made it much more effective. And nobody knows the facts better than Joseph. It was a, an incredible experience because they did not expect to even sit through the 45 minutes we were scheduled to be there. And we were there over an hour. And the puppets made the story visual so that this generation that has a problem mm -hmm. with just sitting and listening, and we've done that to them. We, we've given them too much visual sensory need um, Marilyn adds a wonderful context with her puppets. Uh, and you make them all yourself? I do. I have a great time. I'm, I'm truly not a very grown-up 40-some-year-old um, <laughs> woman. Puppet-making workshops with young people, too. I do a lot with educators, actually, and librarians. And uh, I even did one with rabbis at one point, a storytelling, story writing. Uh, as I get older, I change my venue so that all... When I started, I was purely a puppeteer albeit not a traditional proscenium stage puppeteer. I was uh, up front, out into the audience to control the crowd. I do a lot of crowd control, as you know you need to do. And, and now as I get on with an older audience, I do much more storytelling without puppets. And I, but I find that the older the audience, the more they like puppets. Adults love puppets. Seniors love puppets. High school kids, college kids, I've done some stuff in the community, college community, and they love puppets. In my experience, very young children are often afraid of puppets, and you have yeah. to be very, very careful of how you I'm a relatively like. gentle person, relatively. Uh, and because Depending I use such a audience. bizarre medium, I found this. This is a king. I discovered, starting as a home, a cottage industry, I did a lot of the stuff that I did in the kitchen. My little baby, uh, my little boy, who was then eight months, is now going to be 21, started uh, he would play on the floor and I would make puppets out of whatever was nearby and my first king, and I made him a king because he has a crown, he comes with a crown, was a tiny little fork and this one I found at an art festival. I actually commissioned this woman from Oklahoma to make me a, a fork this size. She was a little bemused by the whole project. So, um, And all of my puppets are thematic so that they tell the story even without me. This is a story about um, challah, which is the bread that Jews traditionally eat on Shabbat. And he is fashioned to look like a challah, a twisted bread. And this is the shamus, and he is the shamus, the, clean, the man who cleans the synagogue, and that's why his mustache is a mm -hmm. broom. Now, nobody really picks up on that very much once in a while. I get that. I tell a story. And about, it's built on a breadboard. On a breadboard. Oh, sure. And then he you has... You get a great deal of pleasure out oh, of Oh, I have a good time. And I have, my friends think I'm absolutely <laughs> off the wall. 
This is Giuseppe. He's the hero of the story. And this is a Sephardic story. It came from our, our Sephardic experience of having been forced to leave Spain 500 years ago. I've done a lot of that this year. Uh, but what it does to the kids, it attracts their attention. The puppets attract their attention. And while I'm busy attracting their attention, I also get them to listen to a story. And while they're really not paying attention, I teach them something. Puppets can do that, but stories do that. The story that Joseph just told, and well, too, Thank you. Uh, is a dynamite tale because it conveys a message, and you're so, your mind processes that. I don't have to tell you that. A story is so much better. It's in the right order as to, opposed to the way we converse with each other, which is all over the map, that we can digest a story and process it in our heads and say, I know what she's talking about. So I find all of that. And it gives children or anyone who's listening something to talk about afterwards. You can mm -hmm. discuss the story. It sets something very important, just a little bit removed. For instance, if going back to your, your AIDS puppet show, that's a, a delicate subject, a vital subject, but something seventh graders usually don't like to hear discussed publicly. They don't like to hear it from parents. Or it's discussed yes. in a detached, scientific, mm -hmm. clinical way that lacks the human sense of urgency. As a clergy person who's mm -hmm. been involved in the problem of HIV AIDS, uh, I always feel that we have an obligation to make the human dimension of the topic something that people can walk away with. And the story and the puppet make mm -hmm. that possible. Well, it becomes theirs. Right. And they have to own the project, obviously. We all have our own stories. I mean, the word history is built around story. His story. Her, Her story. story. I, I'm, I'm prepared to change it. You no, know I that. like history. Let us not argue <laughs> about that. <laughs> it's all semantics. It's so. all semantics. My most favorite kinds of puppets um, are hand puppets because I think they're the most attractive. They're the hardest to see and the ones that I start with later. So I did bring along a couple. That reminds me of, of one of the staff people we have in our cataloging mm -hmm. department, Bob Epstein. <laughs> he, um, he helps me tell a story. What I like about them is they really become actors in the story. And I do, I do not use a stage. I have one that um, looks a little bit like the rabbi to my puppet's immediate right. And he helps me tell some stories. It, what it does for me is it focuses me. When I go into a hospital, for example, to talk to kids, sometimes the, my very first response upon going into a hospital was a little bit nervous. I didn't want to do anything that would harm anybody. I didn't want to um, infringe on their territory, their own particular reasons for being there. And the puppets allow that to happen. Puppets are not threatening people to a child who's been sick and told by a doctor, do this, do that, do this. The, so what I find is that after a while, all they ever did was talk to the puppet. And if I could leave the room, that would be fine with them, as long as I left this guy here. And it, it's a very interesting experience to see the magic of that puppet work. These little guys, with the movement that they are able to do, and the, the lifelikeness of them. And I don't believe they're real, by the way. I, I always say that publicly. These are not real. These are just puppets, tools. Um, help me tell the story. It's very well, interesting. Well, children can talk about things that are frightening or worrying them to a puppet that they might not talk about Absolutely. with an adult. We use them in the library very often because we don't want to be seen as the stereotypic mean librarian talking about the rules. And if you have a puppet who can say in a nice way, let's be careful of those books or remember to get your books back, that again takes them mm -hmm. a little bit farther away. Uh, but the medium doesn't need to stop there. There's uh, lots of different kinds of puppets. This is a obviously a bunch of grapes. And uh, he's from a story called The First Shabbat. The first Shabbat is a story about Adam and Eve as they truly were, which was six days old. And they were trying to figure out how to make Shabbat. Shabbat on Friday, s starting on Friday night, does basically three things to start. You drink, um, you have the hamotzi, the last blessing is over the bread, which we've discussed here. He, so he could be in the story as well. And then you drink a glass of wine. And the first thing you do is light candles. So it's a story about how they get around as babies trying to find Shabbat. And the grape very generously gives of itself for their first glass of wine, which they sat on because they were just babies after all. And they made their first glass of wine. So 
Oh, Children must love the human. They, I use a lot of lovely. everyday objects. I use a lot of ecologically safe things. I have cows out of milk cartons and cats out of cat food boxes. And well, um, I'm reading always up. Some of your background, you you were recycling before there was recycling. Absolutely, <laughs> as we used to call it, garbage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a very weird sense of humor. Kids like it, but what it really does is it number one keeps me awake, <laughs> and uh, it also entices the audience, the adult audience. If you can't keep an adult audience, as Joseph knows by sermonizing, then you've lost them all. And if you do family programming, when a child sees its parent laughing, they know it's okay for them to laugh too. And it's, uh, family programming is the best. It's what works best for me. And in the libraries, I get it all the time. It's a nice medium. I'm interested in that beautiful oh. creature directly beside you. This is the Sabbath Queen. This is the Sabbath Queen. She actually was built, she has two jobs. She was originally built for a wonderful story by um, a new fairy tale writer, although she's not so new anymore. Her name is Jane Yolen. You probably know her. She wrote a story called The Girl Who Loved the Wind. Well, upon further research, I discovered that The Girl Who Loved the Wind was not necessarily a secular tale. It was really written about from a Talmudic story, which is a a Jewish source of a girl who was put in a castle so that she could not marry he who her father had foreseen that she would marry because that's the way things were seen in those days. You could find out what was going to happen. So he tried to lock her away. And in Jane Yolen's interpretation of the story, the wind literally comes through the window and lures her away with its music and, uh, and makes her, you cannot stop fate is the story. But I found another story that I put her in. She was designed after an Indian Indonesian puppet, which moves the puppet itself. The head doesn't move, the body moves back and forth. And uh, so her arms move and her body stays rigid. And that's how she's moved. She's a, so I need to move her like that. Well, and now I use her. That's on your part. To oh, but that's fun. And she and I tell the story together. And she lets me do all the talking. And she does all the moving as I train all my puppeteers, the focus is, it's like magic. If you look at the puppet, while the puppet is moving, everyone will think that the puppet's speaking. And if I she looks at me... I feel she should have a microphone on mm -hmm. now, too, as well, we see, discussed earlier. See, I tried to get you a mic, dear, but they wouldn't give it to you. Hmm. It's okay. Next time. You have to be recalled. And she, she really moves a very graceful form of puppetry, because she really sort of seems to float through the air. And that's all I use. I use very little prop. I just use puppet me. Sometimes I wear a hat. Lots of stuff like that. And what I designed for her was a story about the Sabbath Queen who arrives every Friday afternoon to prepare the people for Shabbat. And that's who she became. So she's used, um, she has two jobs, an actress in many different roles. Well, you have given us some wonderful hints about a few stories that you tell. I think the audience, and I certainly would enjoy hearing uh, whole story. Would you be willing to share a story with us? Sure. My hometown. I told this story, I'll have to give it a little, tiny little bit of history. I told this story at a camp called the Hole in the Wall Gang camp, which was built by Paul Newman from his proceeds from spaghetti sauce, etc. He built it for cancer patients. And though it's a Judaic story, it's about how the little people overcome the odds and beat out the big people. Uh, the kids there all have cancer in some form or another. Some are in remission, some are not. Uh, a lot of the counselors have cancer. It's an incredible place. It was one of those things that changed your life and mine as well. Uh, and I told the story to them. It's about a very famous Judaic hero, more famous than Joseph will be someday in history. Uh, his name was David, and um, I will tell it to you. Once upon a time, there was a young boy whose name was David. He was a shepherd. Now a shepherd, as you may or may not know, was someone who watched the sheep. So no matter where they went, he was always after them. If they went too far to the right, he would bring them over. Too far to the left, he would bring them over. He was just a little boy, but he had a big job. Thank you. <laughs> he also could play the harp, an incredible achievement for such a young man. He played it very well. <laughs> and everyone came to listen. David also had another gift. If you had a dream, a terrible dream, and you came and told it to David, he would tell you what it meant. And usually, he was right. As a matter of fact, until this very day, he'd always been right. 
What happened that day was that King Saul, the first king of Israel, came by. He went right over to David and he said, Excuse me, David, I'm wondering if you're not busy. If you could come and live with me in my castle. And David said, Sure. For when the king comes to call, that's where you go. And off he went. David and the king lived side by side. In fact, David became so important to the king, he was virtually his right-hand man. <laughs> Until the king became jealous of David's talent. He feared that David wanted to become the king of Israel. And in truth, he was right. So the king Saul threw David out of the castle and chased him with his armies. It was, in fact, a full court press. <laughs> they ran as fast as they could, and poor David, he was always ahead of them. He ran and ran. He hadn't eaten for three days until he finally found a place to hide. It was a cave. David quickly snuck inside, and he fell asleep. While David was sleeping, something very strange happened, or perhaps it's happened to you. A tiny little spider climbed up David's body and landed on David's nose, and she hung on for dear life. Now, I don't know if a spider's ever attached itself to your nose, but I can guarantee you that if it did, this was what you would do. <gasps> the spider fell to the ground, looked up at David, and said, What'd you do that for? David said, Don't bother me. Don't you know I'm trying to sleep? I'm tired, and the king is chasing me. And the spider said, I'm here to help you, David. David said, You're too puny to help. Go away and let me rest. <gasps> David fell asleep and the spider, she did the same thing all over again except she landed on his chin. And he did the same thing he did before. <gasps> Laying on the floor, the poor spider hardly knew what to do. Please let me help you, David. David said, go away, you're too small. The spider became very angry and said, none of God's creatures are too small to help. David just laughed <laughs> and fell asleep. Only this time, the spider was not to be stopped. And what did she do? She did what only spiders can do. She built a web so fast, so furious, that within the course of an hour's time, she had built a web to cover the entire entrance to the cave. Any other spider would have taken at least three days to do that. David slept on and slept, and while the spider finished her job, King Saul and his armies came by. Standing at the entrance to the cave, they were about to break through when the army said, don't waste your time, King Saul. No one could be in there, for that web must have been there at least three days. So the king and his armies went on, and David slept safely through that day and the next. When he got up, he looked out the entrance to the cave, and seeing the web, he knew what the spider had done, and he thanked her. For he knew then that none of God's creatures are, in fact, too small to help. David broke through the web and went on to become, of course, the second king of Israel, proving then, as we know now, that none of God's creatures are too small to help another. And that, of course, is the end. Thank you, Marilyn Price. My and pleasure. thank you, Rabbi Edelheit, for being with thank us you. today. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Edelheit and Marilyn Price. Your discussion and your wonderful stories certainly help us all understand the importance of storytelling in preserving our traditions. Thanks to all of you for joining us in All About Kids. Please tune in again. This has been a presentation of Hennepin County Library in conjunction with the Twin Cities Metropolitan Library Service Agency. We thank you for watching and we hope you visit your public library often.